Hi, Tony Hackett is my name, and I'm your host at the Startups Roundtable. And today my guest is Tracy Thompson, who is a co-founder and CEO of HackHunter, and they protect organizations from malicious Wi-Fi network attacks. To hear this story is to understand how deep experience and insight can translate into a unique product. What you may find of great interest is to hear Tracy explain how, where, and why they pivoted from their original go-to-market, and in doing so, found a niche that has scale. B2C, shifting to B2B. It is a wonderful part of the Hack Hunter revolution. So let's hear from Tracy. I'm Tracy, I'm the CEO of Hack Hunter. Uh, Hack Hunter is a cybersecurity company that helps organizations protect their Wi-Fi. We've been working on Hack Hunter for the past, coming up to two years now. And before that, we ran a cybersecurity consulting and software company for 15 years with another business partner. So when we sold that business back in 2017, my co-founder and I went out together, basically started another consulting company just while we were looking for the next thing to do. And I should also say here, my co-founder is also my, my partner in life. So we're partners in business and, and life partners as well. So having run the previous business together, it was logical for us to go out and do it again. Uh, because we found that we complement each other really well and we didn't even think of doing anything else. Uh, So when we were looking for something new to do, the idea for Hack Hunter came up and we've been running with it ever since. Tracy, first of all, that's an interesting dynamic and it probably warrants a a fuller investigation another day on a separate podcast about working with partner and home and how do you keep that line drawn or does it ever happen? But I find it very interesting that you, in the land of cloud and subscription and everything being software defined, you are actually creating a device. And that's obviously the right answer to the question. But could you maybe take me through some of your thought process and maybe some of the challenges that go with creating a device in 2020? Sure, they are many. Although I I can't imagine it's gotten worse. I think the challenges have probably always been there. In our previous business, we had software, so we we wrote software. Uh, We were very familiar with how to do that, and we've been doing that for for many years. When we went into this new business, we were looking for a way that we could marry together my co-founder Mike's experience in security. He's been in security for 30 years. He's done so many things in security, so he has a wealth of experience with his hobby, which is Internet Internet of Things devices. So he had spent a lot of time uh, teaching himself how to code IoT devices by automating our home. And so we were looking for the Venn diagram of of security and IoT. And that's how we found Hack Hunter. Basically, IoT devices are hardware, but but they're like a hybrid. Like they are hardware sensors because they're detecting detecting whatever it is you're detecting. In our case, we detect Wi-Fi signals. And then there's firmware on the chip that that does that detection and then it also does processing as well so it's like software on the hardware and then there's a back end which is the analytics um, engine behind it so it was working out basically how how to do all of that for wi-fi security and the challenges they're very interesting for example when you talk to vc companies uh quite often they'll just say to you it's hardware forget it then they're not interested in anything that's not SaaS because it can't scale as quickly as they think it can. Actually producing a hardware device when you've never done it before is also like extremely challenging. You've got all of the, the the manufacturing side of it. You know, how do you do that? How do you do that in volume? How do you create a, a prototype like an MVP that you can then go out and have people test? So each challenge that we come to, we basically meet that challenge as as we go. So we're at the stage now where we have the hardware device, we have the prototype, it's being tested at the moment, um, and we're about to start launching it in October. And then we start worrying about manufacturing volume. So, of course, in parallel, we've been researching that probably for the last, well, probably for most of this year. Fantastic. We'll make sure we put a, a photo in the show notes or a link to the, the device. I, I must say that when I think about target market and understanding the customer, and I wondered about what you're doing with Hack Hunter. Are you, when you're looking to help people detect unauthorized Wi-Fi access on the networks, 
are you having to explain to people they have a problem they mightn't even be aware that exists? No, when you find the right person in the organisation, they know it's a problem. Like they know Wi-Fi is a problem. They know that it's easy for it to be, in inverted commas, hacked. They know that you know, it's something that they do depending on the organisation you're speaking to. So, for example, we are focusing on financial institutions and critical infrastructure organisations. So we have a proof of concept going with a financial institution and we have one going with the defence prime. But these are organisations that need to know that their environments are secure. And uh, for a financial institution in particular, there's a standard they need to comply to, which is called the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, or PCI DSS, commonly known as PCI. So they have to be compliant, uh, have PCI compliance. Part of that is every quarter they have to actually go out and look for unauthorised Wi-Fi on their network and find it and then remove it because it will always be either a person who's hacking in or it'll be an actual physical device that's been planted somewhere. So when we looked at the market, Mike was aware of this because he did vulnerability assessments for organisations and he knew that there wasn't any easy way to check if your Wi-Fi was secure or not. So we knew it was a problem. So how do they do that? Uh, there's no easy way to do it. Our, our device is so accurate, it can tell you to within a few centimetres where, where the actual source of the unauthorised Wi-Fi is. And it can also tell you if it's malicious. So the, the way they do it now, the devices that they use now can't do that. It's interesting. I was reading a document, I'm sure you're intimately aware, with the 2020 Cyber Report Strategy Document from government. And in it, they were explaining a whole number of recommendations. And one of them was about large organisations needing to be essentially responsible for their supply chain. So as you're speaking now, I was picturing a, an organisation, whether it's financial service or any other, being able to use what the device you're producing out of Hack Hunter to be able to go and rapidly and accurately assess the vulnerabilities of their supply chain, which is fantastic for them as a customer, but also for a service provider to small to medium business who mightn't be in a position to fund it themselves. Is that a reasonable way to think about your proposition as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a managed security service provider who's providing services to a SME could absolutely use our device for Wi-Fi audits, which is basically to check that the Wi-Fi network is secure and that there's nothing there that shouldn't be there. Uh, but we're also um, looking at larger organisations or actually any organisation. Their staff are now working from home. So before COVID, there was a perimeter and all, most of the funding for security was put to making sure that anything within that perimeter was secure, but not anything outside the perimeter. Now the home Wi-Fi is, is the corporate Wi-Fi, but because it's outside the perimeter, there's been no security expenditure on as an executive who's working from home and accessing corporate data, for example. So our, our device can help them to audit that person's home Wi-Fi and environment to make sure that it's secure. That's really interesting. I had not considered that at all. There, there are so many impacts on our working life. And I think if we wind it back six months ago, people may have thought maybe this is a three-month thing. Now it's become a six-month thing. Now we're seeing major organizations calling it an 18-month work from home. And so just as you've explained it, that's that's a really interesting position. And for organizations, it it almost starts to put a an insurance asterisk next to what you're bringing to market, where there's that level of surety, physical surety. That's right. And I mean, security is about risk management. It's about managing the risks, you know, to your organisation. Yeah, if, if I was wanting to, to target a large corporate organisation, I wouldn't try to go in and hack their, you know, hack their Wi-Fi in their head office, right? Because I know there's so much security there. But now that people are working from home, it's so much easier. Right? I can just go and park outside their house and I can spin up my Wi-Fi pineapple and I can just create an organ create a network that looks like their home Wi-Fi, boost the signal, and when they come home and they go to reconnect again to their home Wi-Fi when they walk in the door, it connects to me instead. And once they start using the corporate networks, I've got all the sign-in details. Right. So it, it's a, it's for me, it would be much easier to, you know, to to get into the corporate network that way than it ever has been. And you're 
implicitly describing the use of technology when you look at AI and machine learning and the like. What's your commentary around that and what that means to you? And if I could put a part B, when you look to trends, what are the trends that you're looking toward as far as the technology as well? Okay, yeah, we, we, well, with Wi-Fi, we're really looking at all wireless technology. So we've started with Wi-Fi, but our next cab off the rank is Bluetooth. And then there's Wi-Fi Halo, which is a new standard that's coming in for IoT devices. So when you talk about IoT devices, we're talking about phones and laptops because they're all communicating with the internet. But then you've got manufacturing. uh, You've got uh, manufacturing equipment that communicates with the internet with their management and control systems. You've got energy production utilities as well that do the same. So in heavy industry, you've got a lot of devices that are using Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to connect over the internet with their management and control systems. So that's a lot of vulnerable areas there that, that can be attacked. So we're looking at all of the ways that devices communicate over the internet rather than actually looking at the devices themselves. We're looking at their communication methods and securing those. When it comes to AI and ML and machine learning, we uh, will definitely be using that further down the track to use the data that we gather. So we're uh, with our analytics back end, we are um, gathering the data from our sensors and, and trackers and we'll be using those to create heat maps and to be able to provide data and also to be able to use AI then to predict trends, so to have predictive analysis down the track. And that way, hopefully, we'll be able to provide a lot of really in, you know, interesting and impactful data to our customers. It's almost a prefix. People talk about the consumerization of and then insert whatever it is they're doing. The way that you're describing it, though, makes it very accessible. So whether it's the consumerization of it or not, we could debate the, the language, but very accessible for tech savvy or non-tech savvy to get an immediacy. But the precision is the thing that I, I find quite incredible. So it's not just we have an issue in this building or on this floor, it's at this point. And whilst it's not automation in the sense of software automation, that level of precision is automation. And that, that's, that's powerful. Well, yes, you can take for, for, you can take days pulling apart a room looking for a device that's been planted, and it could be anywhere. We found devices hidden in the floor. We found one, you know, that was on the floor above. So it makes it very, very hard for you to find it in a timely manner, so that you can remove it. And what damage is being happening is happening while you're searching for it. So that's part of the issue. We think that the precision is it's really important. And we think that it's very unique as well. Tracy, with your go to market, when you look at the horizons, what are the horizons that you're thinking to at the moment? And if somebody was listening to the podcast today, looking at starting their own business, how would you encourage them, especially given this isn't your first company? How would you encourage them now to be thinking about planning and what would be the horizons you would point them to? Milestones. So, looking at your product and what you want to achieve. There's some good uh, ways to look at it from different viewpoints, like from the product viewpoint, from the financial viewpoint, from the the number of customers, from how much funding you need. So you can map all of that out and look at your milestones. So, for example, for us, our first milestone obviously was to get the product actually working. So to have an MVP that we could give to people, a prototype that they could use and trial. So we've done that. We've proven that it works. Our next uh, milestone is to launch the product and to to get some customers. And then after that, it's to bring on the next technology and and then it's to expand to the next market. So there's a logical way to look at it. And and that's basically the way that we've done it. As you've built or building this company, you've built previous companies, did you provide some commentary around diversity and how you would encourage startups or any company for that matter, but certainly startups to think about diversity and how to go from thinking about it to actually executing upon the thought? I think it's really hard for small businesses because sometimes it could just be the founders. And if you're both male and, you know, if you're both homogenous, there's not much you can do about that. And also with the startup, when you go to employ your first couple of employees, you have to be really targeted and very specific. So, for example, our first employee 
had to be an expert in programming the chip that we use. And there's probably four people in Australia who are, and they're all male. So you don't have much choice then. So having said that, we are 50-50 gender. It's a bit on gender. So there's four of us, two, two male, two female. So we're doing pretty pretty well there. And it helps, given that I'm female, that helps as well with the diversity. You've already got half, 50% of the founders are female. So that's helpful. And we are lacking, though, is cultural diversity. And that's something that we're going to have to work on. And it's something that I'm really, really conscious of is diversity, to make sure that we have diverse opinions so that we are not all just thinking the same way. And when you're all just thinking the same way, you can end up just doing things which which are not appropriate because you, you've got groupthink happening and you're not being challenged. And part of running a startup in particular is always being challenged and being able to, to work out the best way through that challenge. And multiple diverse opinions is going to help you do that. So it's something that I'm very concerned about. And I can remember saying to someone right at the beginning, it's going to be me and just all of these men because we basically need deep tech programmers, C, C programmers, it's not going to be easy to find female programmers to employ. But so far, it hasn't turned out that way. What I've taken out of what you said is about being conscious and to be not pushing it to the back, but being conscious, still have to make the right decisions in the business. But as long as you're taking in all potential answers to the questions, that, that's the, the key element. There are platforms around that you can use that take away um, bias when you're employing people as well. So that's one way to go. But I've got to say, the people who we've employed, we haven't actually even gone out and advertised it and then got CVs or anything like that. The people who we've employed have been people who've been recommended to us or people who we've known through the community and and have just known that they, if we could employ someone, it would be them. From what I've got to understand about what you're doing, and it's pretty niche. It's not like it's a, a broad, horizontal social media platform, all due respect to people who, who have broad social media platforms, but the actual expertise range is very, very tight. Mind you, you've been involved with accelerator programs, and out of them, there would obviously be an opportunity to bring diversity of, of culture and thought. Could you speak to your experience with the accelerator programs and your encouragement to founders to think about finding an accelerator program? Oh, look, I'm such a huge rep for accelerator programs. They are just the best thing for a startup. And you can see that we've done three of them, which is ridiculous. And we did three of them in our first 12 months. That was strategic because we were so lucky. We came up with the idea for for Hack Hunter and then we applied to Startmate, just not even thinking that we would get in. And we did. And uh, so that was the 2018 Melbourne cohort. I was just amazed that we got in and it was the best experience. It was fantastic. They taught us how to think big and how to think like a startup and it was really brilliant. And then at the end of that, we realised that because we're in cybersecurity, cybersecurity as an industry has particular characteristics. It's small, it's very focused and kind of everybody knows each other and you need to be credentialed. So we went from Startmate straight into CyRise, which is a cybersecurity accelerator specifically. And that was a brilliant experience. And we just were introduced to all of the players in the ecosystem. And we, it was just, it was fan. We got to meet our customers and got to talk to them about our tech. It accelerated things, you know, so much. Like we had a major pivot in the middle which then helped us to come out with the product that we've got now. And if we hadn't have done those two programs, we probably would still be doing what we started off doing two years ago and wouldn't be any further down the track. And then the third one that that I did was SBE Australia, which was for women founders. And that was specifically for me as a woman CEO, because I'd never been a CEO before, to help me with my confidence and to help me with, with working out basically how to run a company and how to act like a CEO. So that was brilliant for me as well. And I use things from all of those programs every single day. And they just, as I said, sped up our progress so much. And the networks are still there for us. So whenever I have something new that I have to do that I need to educate myself on, for example, at the moment, I'm looking at what certifications will be needed for our product for us to sell into the US. Uh, So I've gone out to those networks and I've said, has anyone launched a hardware product into the US before? can you give me advice on how to what certifications are needed so i can go out to them anytime and i will get 
information back from them that then helps me to make my decisions. That's fantastic. Uh, the power of diversity in the it was the second accelerator where something happened that you actually pivoted. Do you remember the, the moment? Because I guess it wasn't just a moment, but the moment where you thought well, we need to shift here. It was really hard. So it was kind of, it was that long, whole long journey. So that was probably halfway through SciRise. So we'd been going for six months. During Startmate, when we first went into Startmate, we thought the product was a consumer product. So people would use it when they were out and about to see if the public Wi-Fi they were going to use was safe or if you were travelling. So we went through that during Startmate and discovered that while there was a market for that, it was too small. So we actually have a beta group of um, people who bought the product and they're using it themselves. But we decided that, that that wasn't the market we wanted to go for. So when we went into Sci-Eyes, we knew we wanted to do enterprise and government. And that was focused more, more towards that, those markets as well. But we went in and we were talking to enterprise and we were saying, this is a device for your traveling execs. So when they're traveling, they can check that the, the hotel Wi-Fi is safe. And they would go, oh, the tech's really awesome, love it. But then you could see them go, I actually don't know if that's a problem. Like, I just don't know if we need that in our organisation. So after having those sorts of conversations, they had an entrepreneur in residence come out from Israel called Ron Moritz. And I can remember sitting with him in a room, he, me and Mike, and actually saying to Ron, do we even have a business? Is there actually something here or not? Or are we just competing with Cisco and all those router companies at a lower price, which means they'll just come out and just, they'll just cream us like there's just no point in doing it so and he said no I think there's something there but you've got to work out what it is so Mike and I went home and for the whole weekend we went and we did a complete competitor analysis and it was awful we were looking at each other going oh my god we've probably just wasted all this time maybe there's nothing here this is just awful and we were both so depressed (laughs) and then at the end of the week weekend Mike's gone actually I think there's something here I think there's this huge gap that none of them are addressing. And it turned out that, yes, it's the it's the portable, the fact that our device is portable, so you can use it anywhere, and the fact that we can locate it to within a few centimetres. Right? They're routers, routers and Wi-Fi network analyzers and other things that, you know, that people use, they can't do that. So that was like the light bulb moment. And we just went, yes, there's this huge gap. No one's doing it. We can, you know, we can do this, we can own this. So that's what we've gone out with. So the tech stayed the same. It was just the use case, really, that that changed. Tracy, it feels like it was a long weekend. It was. (laughs) That's brilliant. I'm wondering if just in closing then you could share some thoughts or your advice on coaches and mentors and how they've played a role for you. And once again, if someone was listening to this and thinking about how they might need to make those decisions, what would be your advice? Yeah, our mentors are amazing, but it's it's a weird thing. We met so many of them. Like we have met so many people who want to be mentors, but it's like any relationship. You can't just walk up to someone and say, you're going to be my mentor. Right? You have to find the ones that you click with and you have to um, find the ones that are going to provide value, you know, and that you get along with. So for us, there's been, we've been so lucky. We've got five of them. And they're basically believers in what we do. They love what we do to the extent that four of them have actually become investors in the company. And they all complement each other because they all have different areas of expertise. Like one of them is definitely on the business side. All the others are pretty much on the tech side. So one of them is, you know, an expert in researching and pulling apart wireless protocols. One of them is an expert in particular on um, penetration testing and and Wi-Fi. One of them is an expert product manager. So he's brought lots of large products to market. And then one of them, or actually two of them probably. So, yeah, and like we just get on like a house on fire with all of them. We talk every month at least. You know, every time I have a problem or some decision I have to make, I will usually go and talk to all of them and find out what they think for that specific area and then that will definitely inform what decisions we make but also they give you intros right so they'll give you intros they'll tell you how they've done things before they're really giving you guidance and feedback all the time and support all the time they're brilliant very generous insights and uh, we've covered a lot of ground today i'm really excited to follow your progress it's a compelling story and you're sharing 
of the journey and the steps you've taken has been tremendous. So, Tracy, thanks for taking the time today. Well, thanks, Tony. It's been great. Really interested to follow the Hack Hunter story. But that's it for today. Thanks for listening and bye for now.